Archetypes are an endlessly interesting topic of discussion, and one that people seem to latch onto in particular is the destructive, wrecking ball-like force of a good heavyweight. I should know, considering my original video on them is still one of the most viewed videos on the channel. I've been meaning for a while now to dive into an archetype series, and while there are still many aspects of that original video that I do like, its style and content are a bit dated at this point to stand alongside future plans. So it seems appropriate to revisit the topic to kick things off, aiming for something that you can enjoy regardless of whether or not you've seen the original. So, without further ado, let's talk about heavyweights. What does the idea of an archetype accomplish? As players, we love to talk about sword fighter this or glass cannon that. In fact, as humans in general, we love neat categories for most things, but this kind of categorization isn't simply for the sake of it. Rather, it's to aid in discussion, discovery, or both. Your friend might direct you towards a certain store because your fashion tastes have started to lean more bohemian. Yeah man, I love Cage the Elephant. They're kind of modern rock, indie rock, a bit grunge, a bit punk. I think you'd be into them. I like stall teams. Let's check out some modern builds that are doing well. While categorizations can often be messy, heavyweights and smash are particularly so, as the term can refer to multiple ideas. The first of these is an encompassing description of a specific type of character, a large, hulking presence who specializes in raw power. The second, however, is a simple trait description, literally a character with a heavy weight. Weight is a variable used to express the notion of survivability in a platform fighter as opposed to, for example, the varying health bars seen in some traditional fighting games and affects how far each character will be launched when hit by an attack. Looking at these guys, you'd expect them to have a high weight, and you'd be correct, these are indeed some of the heaviest characters in the game. Now looking at Sonic, a character known for his extreme speed, you'd expect him to weigh less than them, and again, you would be correct. Now what if through altering a single line of code code we made Sonic just as heavy. Would he now be a heavyweight? By the broadest definition, yes, but when people refer to the heavyweight archetype, this will generally not be the image that comes to mind. The main purpose of an archetype, genre, fashion style, or any other type of categorization is to evoke a specific concept as clearly as possible. And if the category becomes stretched too thin, a new one is typically created, which is how electronic music can become techno, can become splittercore. Anything can be a valid design concept with the right balancing. If you took every person on Earth and said to make me a character as fast as Sonic and as heavy as Bowser, it seems unlikely that nobody could pull that off while making it fair. But it wouldn't evoke the same idea that the word heavyweight is usually intended to. In fact, it would be so far removed from anything we've seen so far in the series that it would likely require a new archetype to describe it. So for the sake of this video, we're going to be focusing on the more traditional bruiser style of character, which you might have heard referred to as super heavyweights. In the current Smash entry, these are roughly grouped both into a weight range and other broadly shared characteristics. Summing up heavyweights as simply as possible, their concept leans on the fundamental trade-off of agility in exchange for power, a trade-off which permeates throughout their design. They tend to do a lot of damage with each attack, which means they require fewer hits than usual in order to get their opponents to kill percentage. This is further augmented by the many extremely high knockback attacks in their movesets, meaning that this kill percentage is also generally lower than normal. However, while this kind of power is thrilling, and what gives heavies that destructive feel, it doesn't come without a price. To begin with, Super Smash Bros. uses a move's damage as part of the calculation for how far to launch an opponent. Opponent. This is obviously fantastic when trying to end a stock or set up an offstage situation when you want to knock your opponent as far away as you can, but for combo scenarios, you want the opposite, for your opponent to remain as close to you as possible. This means that heavyweights don't usually have the ability to perform large combos, and while they still do plenty of damage, they don't allow you to drag your opponent across or above the stage in the same manner that more nimble characters are capable of, making them worse from a positional perspective in scenarios where they're not killing. This short combo combo issue is exacerbated further by another element of the agility for power design philosophy poor frame data. Attacks are typically slow to start up, meaning quicker characters can frequently bully them if they're within attack range. Of course, because heavyweights are larger than average, they'll usually have good range for a hand-to-hand -hand fighter, but in practice, keeping your opponent at a distance at all times is easier said than done. This means that heavyweights often end up susceptible to pressure, and unless you're one of the lucky few to have been gifted with a good way to mitigate it, matches against speed-based characters can feel like you're constantly being run over. High end lag, or the time between the end of an attack's dangerous period and the time you can act again only makes this worse as they dart in and out of your effective range, which is easy to do because of another aspect of this agility for power trade-off, 
limited mobility. You may initially expect this to refer to running speeds, and while there is certainly a trend towards this, Super Smash Bros. has always prioritized matching the feel of a character to how they feel in their home series. Donkey Kong, for example, has consistently been a pretty quick runner, which matches the way he's portrayed in Donkey Kong Country, and Charizard and the modernized Bowser likewise can keep up on the ground fairly well. However, there's always some aspect of their mobility which is impaired. If not run speed, then jump squat frames before Ultimate standardized them, air speed, air acceleration, rolling, or overwhelmingly recoveries. Heavyweights essentially all have recovery special moves which are either short-ranged, extremely linear, or both, which moves us towards the next aspect of this discussion. At its core, belonging to any archetype involves making a deal with a dev developer. Of course you can have this power. What are you willing to sacrifice for it? While a description of the sacrifices heavyweights make sounds sensible on paper, its practical execution throughout the Smash series from a competitive standpoint has had its fair share of problems. Let's take survivability. Weight reduces the distance you're launched, as we discussed, which means that the archetype should survive until higher percents than its competitors. This is balanced out, though, by the fact that you're also a larger target who's more susceptible to combos due to that reduced launch distance. While your kill percentage is higher than average, you'll also reach faster. Okay, those are reasonable terms. But there's more to it than that. In competitive Smash, there are, broadly speaking, three main phases. Neutral, Advantage, and Disadvantage. Neutral is when each character is on even footing and trying to land a hit. You'll often hear references to how strong an attack is in the neutral, how good a character's neutral game is overall, and this is the concept that's being referred to. Once that hit connects, the character who landed it transitions into advantage state, while the character who got hit transitions into disadvantage state. If you're in advantage state, your goal is to keep it that way. If you're in disadvantage state, your goal is to return to neutral as quickly as possible, and heavyweights don't tend to be very good at this. In a vertical launch, or juggling scenario, the fact that they're large targets, have poor mobility, and poor frame data makes it easy to keep them up there, which is a natural consequence of the archetype's design philosophy. There's also the inverse scenario. If a heavyweight has their opponent in the air, escape is often relatively straightforward because of these same restrictions to agility. This is certainly a concern, and we will come back to it, but again, it is a natural consequence for this type of character. Offstage play, however, is a different scenario entirely. As said, heavyweights typically have slow, linear, easy to intercept recovery options, which makes edgeguarding them extremely easy. This functionally means that while, yes, a forward smash is less likely to actually send you into the blast zone than for other archetypes, your effective point of no return is often shorter than this, in the most egregious cases, far shorter. This design philosophy undercuts the archetype's vitality, a trait which could reasonably be expected to be one of their major strengths, and I personally consider it to be a shortcoming of heavyweight design throughout the Smash series. There are, after all, plenty of other areas that can be used to express the fundamental trade-off without detracting from survivability. Heavyweight damage and kill power is also undermined by their generally subpar neutral games. Part of this is a natural consequence of the restricted mobility these characters suffer, which will inherently be a major hindrance in a game genre so heavily centered around movement, but they're also rarely given adequate tools to compensate. Projectiles and other space-controlling attacks are few and far between, and those that do exist are generally much more specialized than their competitors. This often forces heavies to play the rushdown game while being poorly equipped to do so, and we're starting to see this fundamental trade-off begin to warp. On paper, being heavy makes you take more damage, but survive longer. This is a natural result of Smash's gameplay mechanics. In practice, the archetype is often more frail than you might expect. On paper, heavyweights have high damage output. In practice, the additional difficulty with landing a hit and avoiding hits themselves means that while they may have impressive bursts, their overall damage per second is frequently quite tame. A pure exchange of agility for power is not an even trade in the platform fighter genre. A character who gives up power in exchange for the ability to safely interact with the opponent will be a character who rewards good play, whereas a character who gives up the ability to interact in exchange for power will place the onus on the opponent to play incorrectly. In the competitive singles world, this happens but is unreliable, but less so with players who are inclined to make mistakes or have outside assistance, meaning that heavyweights may be fundamentally more suited for and balanced around a casual environment. This is a common argument I've heard, and while I do agree with it to an extent, it's worth noting that limited recoveries and other aspects of impaired mobility are a huge hindrance when you play the item game. This is of course speaking from a more default perspective of what would happen if you took the fundamental agility for power trade-off at face value and left it alone, which for the first few Smash titles, 
unfortunately does tend to be the case. That's not to say, though, that character design hasn't evolved to compensate over the years as developers begin to take Smash Balance more seriously. Throughout the first two Smash games, heavyweights largely fall into this exchange without much consideration beyond that, with high damage output and kill power being one of their few high points with little thought towards compensating for weaknesses. It shouldn't be surprising that none of these characters were considered competitively powerful, with Melee Bowser in particular being a candidate for the worst Smash character of all time. Another candidate for the title came along in Brawl with Ganondorf's Twilight Princess redesign, and in this game the trend was largely the same although there were a few interesting roster additions with Snake and King DDD. DDD was considered to be a high tier or upper mid tier throughout most of the game's life, although this was largely due to the existence of a powerful chain grab which was likely not an intentional design decision. Snake, in the meantime, was a top tier, but in addition to being in a very ambiguous archetype, Snake's design overall is quite strange. There's a rumor that Snake was originally intended to be a larger character but was scaled down at the last minute, indicated not only by his outrageously high weight, more than that of King DDD, but also by the infamously large, disjointed hitboxes on many of his attacks that barely seem to match the character model. I've looked far and wide for information either confirming or debunking this and haven't been able to find any. I issued a correction about it in my previous Heavyweights video. But even if it's false, Snake's design is definitely an anomaly in the Smash series. Something weird is going on here. Moving into Smash 4, we see the first major upward trend in attentiveness towards the competitive scene, which brought heavyweight design along for the ride. This is most starkly illustrated with Bowser, who received a massive overhaul to his moveset, attributes, and appearance, becoming a considerably less lumbering character than had been seen in the past. In the early days of the game, he was considered to be extremely powerful, although as knowledge of the game increased and the Wii U's tighter controls supplanted those of the 3DS, his reputation did begin to fall off. This remained true up until the introduction of his notorious upthrow rework in a patch, reducing its knockback considerably and allowing combos all the way from zero to kill percents. A similar fate was shared by Donkey Kong's cargo upthrow, and for the first time, traditional heavyweights were seeing success in a platform fighter. They were still far from top tiers, were generally reserved for counter picks at top level, and heavyweights without this kind of extreme grappling capability were still anomalies in the competitive scene. But it was certainly a notable step up in performance, even if reliant on fairly one note design. Moving into the current Smash title, a major focus of Ultimate has been to diversify character movesets while bringing them further into balance with each other. This meant that Bowser and DK's throws, which almost entirely defined the characters in Smash 4, were reworked again, with Bowser's kill confirms removed entirely and DK's limited, although his overall grab game remains excellent and still firmly categorizes him as a grappler. And the same could be said for Bowser's multiple lethal throws and powerful command grab. Ultimate also pays considerably more attention to traditional weaknesses of the archetype and pulls from a variety of mechanics in an attempt to mitigate them. In terms of universal mechanics, they benefit the most of anyone from the three-frame standardized jump squat, as in previous entries this was a major factor used to hinder their mobility and also functionally added extra startup to their already unresponsive rising aerials. Neutral is further improved with a higher concentration of anti-projectile tools compared to previous entries, including King Dedede's improved inhale, Bowser's improved fire breath, but I think most notably demonstrated by Ultimate's newcomer super heavyweight both having a counter which is effective against projectiles. Additionally, this indicates an increased amount of attention paid to heavyweight's poor disadvantage states, which is also seen through the increased role of armor this time around. Armor is a tool frequently given to heavyweight characters in fighting games in order to overcome their sluggishness, and while it's had a presence in previous Smash games, there's far more of it on display in Ultimate. Donkey Kong gained an armored headbutt, King DDD a hammer, Bowser had his tough guy mechanic from Smash 4 improved considerably, and gained some degree of armor and or invincibility on all his tilts and smash attacks, and Incineroar and King K. Rool each come stocked with multiple invincible or armored attacks, with King K. Rool in particular heavily utilizing a unique belly armor mechanic. Both newcomers also have access to above average recoveries for their archetype, but to clarify, these are still highly exploitable. In fact, a lot of the considerations discussed haven't necessarily panned out in practice nearly as well as the developers likely intended. That said, comparing Incineroar to Ganondorf, who share large amounts of design space, the difference in approach between the newcomer and veteran is on clear display. Ganondorf has arguably clung hardest to the pure agility for power model seen most prominently in earlier Smash games, and while he does feel extremely destructive as a result, his reputation has unfortunately fallen quite a bit, despite initially positive reception. It's difficult to say how good heavyweights in Ultimate are overall, because even after a year into the game's life, tier lists still regularly shift, but it seems reasonable to say that they're good enough 
The frontrunner is generally agreed to be Bowser, who maintains all the strengths of the archetype, less of its typical frame data and mobility weaknesses than usual while receiving the full gamut of compensating factors, and a bit of extra spice thrown in just because. I consider other highlights to be Donkey Kong's consistently great grab game as well as a surprisingly fluid aerial presence, and the role that Charizard plays in Pokemon Trainer's kit. Now, some of Ultimate's heavyweights in particular still certainly do struggle in plenty of matchups, but are generally at least reasonable to keep around as a pocket character if you're comfortable with them, with a few borderline solo viable fighters. To be fair, this applies to most playstyles in this game's roster, but maybe what the developers intended as a sweet spot for this archetype in particular. They're very difficult to balance, and a true top tier heavy would likely either need to be so absurdly lethal that it would be very frustrating to fight even at top level, to say nothing of how your little brother would feel, or have so many of its traditional weaknesses mitigated that it would significantly break the mold for this type of character. This was the approach taken by Rivals of Ether, an independent platform fighter. While there are four characters in the game's roster that could reasonably be called heavyweights, the only one who plays particularly traditionally is Craig. And even then, he taps into plenty of unique design space. Edelus becomes one of the most rushed down heavy rivals thanks to his unique ice mechanic, and Sylvanos and Eliana are clear hybrids with the Zoner archetype. I think the most important points to note, though, are that these characters are creative, fun, and balanced. And while the developers stepped away from some of the archetype's conventions to accomplish this, it's a successful approach, and I'd love to see some of these concepts further explored. Maybe even in Smash. Heavies definitely had it rough in the early days of Smash, although as the series progressed and new platform fighters came along, we've begun to see the concept better utilized, which as a fan of the archetype both as a player and spectator, I'm greatly appreciative of. These characters inherently have debilitating flaws built into their designs, arguably more so than any other type of fighter. And while overcoming these flaws can certainly be a challenge whether we're talking about as a player or a developer, the satisfaction from doing so, as far as I'm concerned, is virtually unmatched in this genre. Thanks for watching everyone, and hey, if you liked it, why not leave a like? Let me know your thoughts on Heavyways, and if there's another archetype you'd strongly like to see tackled like this, feel free to drop it in the comments. But before that, be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell, follow me on Twitter at MrMockRock to see what I'm up to, and check me out on Patreon for exclusive content, early video access, Discord discussions, and other cool rewards. Later, people! I'm going to limit the content of this video to memes which are relevant to Ultimate because it's absolutely fantastic as... and... Are. We've just taken a look at the best of every Smash Ultimate move, and as difficult as that list was to make... Oh my god, this was so much worse. Nothing like trying to analyze a big old pile of obscure moves nobody uses or talks about.